Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here's your host, editor Christian Berg. All right, welcome to the Bow Hunting Podcast. We are all bow hunting all the time. And today I'm excited about having a great conversation about the craze that's sweeping the nation. It's saddle hunting, folks, and I've got one of the foremost experts here in the country, Mr. Greg Staggs from Staggs in the Wild. How you doing, buddy? I'm really good, buddy. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be on your podcast. And, uh, you know, we go back a ways. And so uh, excited about talking about this because uh, uh, you and I hooking up and writing that feature several years ago was kind of what kicked this whole thing off, or, you know, at least in the forefront for Peterson's bow hunting and all that. Well, I mean, yeah, it's crazy to think like, man, how big saddle hunting has gotten in the last 10 years. It's, um, you know, because it's not new. It's it's a tool that's yeah. been out there for a long time, but it seems to have captured everybody's imagination. And, you know, yeah, you wrote a great piece for us several years back now, kind of really brought us, you know, into the modern age in terms of saddle coverage and and we've been right. kind of trying to stay on top of it and you started now i think you were already doing it some you know before you wrote for us but you've done a lot just in the last couple of years with your youtube videos and that's generating a ton of interest for you it is it is you know believe it or not i, I started that after i wrote that cover story for for you uh featuring saddle hunting and, and you're right saddle hunting has been around for you know 20 years longer whatever but I think the advent of mobile hunting and its popularity and the, and the skyrocketing prices of leasing a piece of property, right? I think that goes hand in hand, uh, at least for me it does. You know, I make a, a very good living with what I do career-wise. And still, you know, when, when I have a friend reach out to me and says, hey, you interested in going, going in on a lease next year? And I'm like, uh, okay, maybe. What, what, what are you talking about? And they shoot me a figure of several thousand dollars for a year, for 12 months. And, and you can only hunt three months of those 12, you know? So, so in essence, you're talking about a three-month opportunity for several thousand dollars. I'm like, no thanks. I, I'll keep up my public land. And, and so I think that combination of that whole movement of skyrocketing prices, people are realizing, the farmers are realizing what they've got in their back pocket with the land they've got, the deer they've got. And it's just better to go out and hunt public land. All that combines for this mobile hunting movement of, man, I just want to be as mobile as possible and go out running gun and, and saddle hunting is a perfect fit for it. It really is. And, you know, I don't want to spend too much time uh, getting into the basics of saddle hunting. I think at this right. point, everybody has pretty well, you know, got some idea. Chances are, if you're listening to this, because honestly, you know, this podcast is probably not for your casual bow hunter, you know, and I and I think I'm not going to go out on a limb by saying that the casual bow hunter is probably not your big time saddle hunter. I, I would 100% agree. Um, but I would say this for those casual bow hunters who might be listening or just for anybody who's listening who hasn't tried saddle hunting because Greg is, you know, way, way deeper into it than I am. But even for somebody who doesn't go, you know, that far, I don't do a ton of public land hunting, at least not here in Pennsylvania. When I travel, I sometimes do, and I have done, even with my saddle. My first saddle kill was actually on a, a walk-in ranch in Montana. So, you know, that was a great way to get started. But even if you, you know, hunt a lease, like, like Greg just talked about, even if you, you know, have permission, maybe on, on a buddy's property, maybe a farm down the road, a saddle is an awesome tool. It's just the mobility that it gives you, you know, not just in what Greg's going to get into probably a little bit later, talking about going a long distance from the vehicle, but I just mean even moving from tree to tree to tree, even within a small area, I found it's amazing how much that will keep the deer completely like confused or off guard or whatever you want to call it. When you talk about keeping the element of surprise in your favor, to me, that's probably the number one thing that the saddle has done. And I've seen, you know, my efficiency really increase by, by using one. Absolutely. I had the honor and privilege to talk with a guy who, I, I, he was from West Virginia or Virginia a couple of years ago. I was up working the the Iowa Expo show, the, the Deer Hunters Expo in, in Iowa, and there was a guy who brought the mount. It, he was, I can't even remember, it was a 297-inch deer that he killed in Illinois. It, it was huge. 
and I don't remember the exact particulars, but I do remember specifically talking to this guy at the booth when it cleared out. I went up and talked to him some, and I was asking him kind of how it happened, and, and what happened was he came into a lease situation where there were about eight other guys, and he was kind of the Lone Ranger out, right? These are all good friends, and he kind of was a tag-along. He was kind of a third wheel, and so they all picked the premier spot, right, that they wanted to go hunt, and as a, as a side note, they're like, oh, um, yeah, you, you go hunt over there. And, and they kind of kicked him to the curb and like kicked him to a spot that was like, you know, not that great of a spot. He ended up killed. They all had this, this deer on film on camera, right? They all knew he was there. He was a monster. And they were getting videos and pictures of him on trail cameras. And they just put him over in the back corner. That's where he killed the deer. And he said it was because all these guys had the good spots picked out. That deer knew all the good spots on that lease. He avoided them like the plague during during daylight hours. And they were getting him on camera at night, other places. They knew he was there. But they kicked him off to some unused spot. He killed the monster. So so mobility and getting into places that the deer haven't patterned you as a hunter, that's key. Absolutely. So, you know, how long have you been saddle hunting, Greg? Because like you said, you know, you've always been kind of a big public land guy. And I'm sure yep. that over the years you've done it all. You've used you know, old, old man, you know, climbing stands and you've used hang-ons and sticks yep. and you've hunted on the ground, I'm sure. And so when did the saddle kind of really become your niche? About five years ago, I had a really good friend of mine, uh, Scott Hesterly, lives on the other side of the state. We've actually worked together in different career fields and, and uh, he, he's one of the only guys that I know that hunts as hard and as many times a year as I do. And he kept sending me a text message saying, dude, have I told you about my tree saddle? Have I told you about my saddle? I'm just enjoying my saddle. And I'm like, dude, uh, okay, enough of this. I mean, he was literally sending me 20 texts a, a week about how much he was enjoying his tree saddle. And about five years ago, I I uh, decided to look into it. And that's when right at shortly after that, I started looking into it and investigating. I'm like, you know, there might be something here from a mobile run and gun sample. Because that's, you're right, from day one, 1990, I was a sophomore in college in undergrad school. And I was looking to supplement my grocery bill. Uh, grew up really poor. My parents didn't save for college. So literally, if I could go out and kick up a rabbit or a squirrel on a weekend, that helped. And I know it sounds ludicrous now to, to think about that, uh, but it did. And so I was looking at putting more meat in the freezer. So from since 1990, I've been running and gunning on public land. But it started off with a steel V-bar climber, you know, um, and then it moved to, you know, crampered screw and steps and a hang on. And I, I've done it all. Um, and so about five years ago, I transitioned to saddle and, and it opened up, uh, I, it, you know, I've done hang on to sticks. You can get in any tree with a hang on stick. I'm not a saddle hunter who is trying to say that I can get in a tree with a saddle that you cannot with a hang on and sticks. I, I can get, if I can get into it with saddle, I can get into it with a hang on. It just makes, it's less bulk. It's less weight. It's easier. It's safer. Uh, saddle hunters in general are by far safer than someone hanging sticks and a hang on because most of those guys, and I'm one of them, was guilty of not using lineman belts and the proper safety equipment when you're hanging stuff. Saddle hunters, by nature, by default, we're safer because we're always tethered in or roped in usually. So, uh, yeah, it's been a fun ride. Well, you, you know, you said it sounds ludicrous to think about how getting a squirrel or a rabbit. I just wanted to go down a rabbit trail on that one because. It's funny. Look at what the prices are these days of meat. Um, la la last night, I fried up a couple pounds of chip steak, you know, venison chip steak with some fried onions and some nice seasonings. And man, we had some sandwiches and they were out of this world. And I was talking to my wife. I said, could you imagine if we were buying beef for all this stuff? I said, one of the biggest blessings that I have is two freezers in my basement, chock full of, of game meat. And like the value of that, you know, the street value of my venison is at an all time high. You know what I mean, buddy? It's crazy. Yeah. My wife and I, you know, it's well documented if you followed my story, any, you know, I was actually featured on NBC's America Now with Leslie Gibbons and John Stossel, my family was. We haven't bought meat in a store for 27 years for some, something like that, red meat. Uh, we'll buy salmon or, or pork or something like that to break it up. But I have not bought beef in a store in 27 years because I kill enough deer with my bow, archery, over the county, do, over the counter, do it yourself, public land. You know, I, I average probably five or six deer a year. And uh, we were in Sam's Club about two months ago while the season was still going on. We were mid-season, and we happened to walk by the beef counter. My wife looked down and saw a package of tenderloins, and they were like $60 for a small package of tenderloins. 
And I said, I think I'll go kill another deer real quick. And I did. I went and killed two more deer before the season ended. So, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that absolutely we don't run out of meat because I, it, I would be a gas to go buy meat at today's prices. Well, yeah, and you've got, uh, you know, I also want to bring your kids into this because you've got a couple – you got a couple of boys that are absolutely, you know, eaten up with bow hunting as well. And they it's are. been in, it's been interesting because, you know, I mean, they're still relatively young teenagers, I think, both of them. And yep. so they don't know what it was like to hunt with a 30 pound climber that, you know, was sticking two feet over their head. And you're trying to walk through the woods and you're slamming that thing into every limb and tree that you walk by and making all kinds of noise, getting that thing on and going up. And and like they they've been saddle hunting kind of from the get go. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So my oldest, when I took up saddle hunting, um, it. it he really didn't buy into the theory or the concept as much. He's still hunting out of a lone wolf cane climber. He swears, in fact, this is his first year at college. He's a freshman at Missouri State in Springfield, Missouri. And he's actually on his way home right now. And this summer, he swears he's going to get, he's going to learn how to one stick. Well, I'm sure we'll probably talk a little bit about that. He's going to learn how to saddle hunt, everything. My youngest, from day one, of course, he was 11 years old when, when I got him into saddle hunting. So he saw the benefits immediately of not carrying on at the time. I was letting him lug in a big Summit Viper. Summit's a great stand, but for an 11-year-old, the, the bar, he needed that shooting rail to, to hold up a shotgun uh, when he was hunting or, or a rifle. He needed that armrest. And so the, that shooting rail would hit him in the shins or the ankles, the back of the Achilles tendons. And so it was just a struggle. And he was break out into a flop sweat, flop sweat trying to get up a tree to 15 foot. And so he saw the, the benefits immediately. My oldest has been slower to adopt it. And my youngest makes fun of my oldest all the time. Whenever we go hunting somewhere, my, my oldest is carrying a lone wolf hand climber, which is fantastic. I've killed no telling how many deer I have a lone wolf hand climber, a great stand. But my youngest will, will just literally ridicule my oldest about how the fact he's carrying a big old heavy 16 pound stand, which is what a hand climber weighs from lone wolf. He's like, I can't believe you're doing that. So it's funny watching, watching them. Yeah, well, it's one thing, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk, too, about, you know, how you started with, you know, different equipment and and like your older son still uses it. That's one thing that's a big stereotype, which isn't true in the saddle community is that, you know, hey, if you're a saddle guy, then you say, you know, tree stands are garbage. But you've already mentioned a couple of times, hey, you know, I could use a tree stand and you've got family who use a tree stand. And, you know, that's what I always say, too, like now. I, it's not necessarily what I'm known for specifically like it is for somebody like you in terms right. of the saddle hunting. But it's like I tell people all the time, hey, I'm not telling you that I'll never hunt out of a tree stand or that I'm not going to go because, you know, I've got, I don't know, 15 fixed position stands on several properties in the area. I'm not telling you I'm never going to go hunt in those places. I'm just saying that there are times in, of the season or particular deer uh, or, or opportunities, depending on, I mean, hey, here's something as simple, again, for somebody like me who does a lot of hunting on the same properties, wind shift, okay? So your fixed position stand is not good for that day. Well, what are you going to do? Just stay home? Or are you going to grab the saddle and say, hey, I'm going to shift my setup just a little bit, get the wind in my favor, and I can still hunt th- th- that same group of deer, you know? Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, some of the, one of the things that we talked about earlier is, is how many deer I, I kill a year to be able to afford my family. I, I, one of the frequent questions I receive when people realize that I don't buy red meat, my wife doesn't, we don't have to go to the grocery store. It's like, well, how many a year does it, a year does it take to feed you? And I'm like, I have to have three. And that is, I mean, literally I have to have three. Four, I can take a sigh of relief. I can take a deep breath. Things are getting better. Five, I can actually anticipate bringing some people over and having cookouts on the grill and on the deck and stuff. So, Four to five is my preference. Having said that, my my personal preference is I don't want to take all those five deer from the same herd. I don't want to impact the local community that much. So I bounce around a lot in a 15, 20, 30 mile radius. Uh, you know, where I hunt is, is we're very blessed. We have a large, large hod, hodgepodge or patchwork of public land everywhere. So, you know, if I kill one deer in one area, uh, especially a doe, uh, which is what most, you know, I, I kill one or two bucks you know, every couple, three years, it seems like, because I'm really at that point in my career where I'm holding out for something that I'm going to mount. You know, if it, if it doesn't go to the taxidermist, I'm probably letting him walk. And so most of the deer that go in our freezer are does. Well, I don't want to take five does out of the same same herd. 
So I bounce around all over the place, and that's where the saddle is really helpful, bouncing all around in those places. Well, you mentioned it earlier, and I don't want to wait any longer till we get into it, because I know that this is going to be the big draw for the people who have jumped into this episode, because I'm actually going to put it in the title. So we're just yeah. recording this now, but I can tell you when this podcast goes up, it's going to say one sticking in the title, because this is where I really want to get into the nitty gritty, because, you know, we could do all this basic stuff of talking about, you know, how people say saddles aren't comfortable. Trust me, they're comfortable. You know, this, that, and the other, they're, you can't shoot out of them. They're great to shoot on. Well, we could debunk all that, but I think that's all been done. But what I really want to get into is this whole one sticking, because, you know, when I look at you, I pretty much see myself, okay, in terms of stature. I'm like, okay, I think you're just a couple of years older. You said you were a sophomore in college in like 90 or 91, and I graduated high school in 91. So you're probably like two years older than me. And again, okay, same stat, basic size, and neither one of us is like in danger of winning any bodybuilding competitions. And, and, and you know, here's Greg Staggs. You know, 50 years old, give or take, right? Going out and one sticking like a freaking trapeze artist, going up these trees with one stick, 20, 25 feet, and then he's rappelling down out of this tree like Tarzan. And people are like, no, nah, man, no, nah, I ain't ever doing that. And right. you're like, hey, don't knock it till you try it. You know, so I am a perfect example of someone who did knock it till I tried it. I mean, I. There were a couple of videos out there before of, you know, I, you know, let me preface to say, I'm not the, I'm not the guy who brought this to the world or it was already a concept, just like saddle hunting was already a concept, right? Uh, I think we hit upon a lucky formula when I launched a video on my YouTube channel, which is really widely well known across the saddle hunting community now. And it's called One Sticking So Easy That a 13 Year Old Can Do It. That video is closing in on 90,000 views. It's really one of the ones that kind of launched the movement. There were others out there before, but they never made it look easy. And and so I, I had seen those videos too. And I looked at them, I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Literally, that's what the guy who tried to get me into one sticking, I, I told him, I'm like, that's stupid. That, that's the hardest thing. Why would I ever want to try that? And so um, I, I had zero interest in it. I invited that friend to come over and hunt with me last year or two years ago now, whatever it's been uh, for, a, for a rut hunt. And one of the days, it was like 65 degrees in the by 10 o'clock. I'm like, well, we went home, and my son was struggling. The same one who struggled carrying in that big hand climber, he was struggling to to pack up his four sticks and put them on a stand and strap them up and all that stuff. The 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 after effects of of the hunt. I was going to his tree. I'm like, I was standing there waiting for him for 15 minutes. I'm like, dude, can you hurry up? We let's go. And uh, my my friend said, let me show him how to one stick. It's going to help so much easier. It won't be folding up and packing sticks and all this stuff. So we just walked out behind my house and it was just a, it was kind of a stroke of good luck. I happened to grab a handy cam to film it just for our personal use because my friend lived four hours away. I'm like, let, you're going to show my son Gabe how to do this. And when you're gone, I don't know anything about it. So I filmed it and videoed it just so that when he left, if I had questions, I could go back and watch the video. Well, halfway through this filming session and him showing my son how to do it, I'm like, that's a little different than what I've seen before. That makes how you're doing it makes sense. And so we started from there on out and it is so easy. You know, you talk about how it may not look, it may look like I'm a trapeze artist and repelling like Batman and Tarzan and all this stuff. It's so easy. It literally is so easy. A 13 year old can do it. It's so easy that a 52 year old can do it without breaking a sweat. It doesn't take any extra calorie burns. I've started making some videos showing that how easy it is. You're literally hanging there by a rope to pick up the stick and move it up above you. You're not burning any calories. Well, so let's get into it, you know, and again, check out Stags in the Wild, right? YouTube, search for that on YouTube. You'll find Greg's videos. Obviously, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, we're talking about it here. and We're not actually going to be able to demonstrate it on this podcast. So you're going to want to check that out. But, you know, just start with the basics. You know, really, what is one sticking? Mm -hmm. And then walk me through, you know, probably the easiest way to do it, right, is to just get me to the base of the tree yeah. and, 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 and tell me everything that you do from the time that you get up to the time that you get down. Yeah, so it's really nice. So most of us that are in this niche of one sticking, 
uh, we either use a 12 or a 15 inch stick. That's literally the total length of the stick. So remember years ago, we, we climbed with 30 inch lone wolf sticks, right? And then they kind of got shorter and now the world is like into 24 inch sticks. When you're one sticking, you're literally doing a 12 or a 15 inch stick. Uh, some people will use an 18, but by and large, most people use a 12 and probably the predominant majority use a 15. I use a 12 personally. Uh, because in my mind, the stick serves no other purpose than it's separate. It's a placeholder between your top little platform. So at the top of the one stick is a little platform that you can stand and pivot on and turn it around and, and uh, take all your shots from. And it's a small, it's, it's usually, you know, 10 inches by 12 inches or so. Okay, so I, I, want, I, want to, I want to interrupt you. So not only, you're not, you not only one stick, but you're saying you don't carry a separate saddle platform I either. I don't, and a lot of people don't either. Uh, some of them okay, so so so, so so what are what are you using personally? Did you customize something, or do you use one of the sticks where the manufacturer makes the saddle that you can basically use in place of the top step? Yeah, so so when we got hooked up and started doing this, we were having to buy parts and assemble them um, from from a company that a lot of one stickers utilize called Eastern Woods Outdoors. It's a Michigan based company that supplies a lot of saddle hunters with gear and parts. They started off, they were really famous for making a double step that when, when all the climbing sticks only had a single step that pivoted back and forth and rotated back and forth, they came out and offered an aftermarket double step. And so they actually owned the domain name doublesteps.com. Um, but Eastern Woods Outdoors is the company behind that. And they started supplying more and more and more saddle hunters with parts. And so I would buy the tube and the double step and the aider and the platform top and all, and I bought all those separately. There's actually a video on Stacks in the Wild of it, it says, "Hey, we got our one sticking gear, assembling our one sticking stick," and it shows us literally assembling that. Or well, right after we launched that video and it came out and dropped, they said, "You know what? We'll offer this as a package. If people are going to buy all these parts and put it together, now you can just click a button and order order what you want." And so uh, it's literally an Eastern Woods Outdoors. It's called an Ultimate One Stick. And there's different uh, different choices. You can get a smaller platform, a bigger splat platform. The one that I use is called an Ultimate Platform UP Top. And so it comes out straight and then has an angle because as a saddle hunter, I'm a leaner. And so I lean back while I'm sit sitting in my saddle all the time. So I like that angle. Think of it if you go to a barber shop and you're sitting in the barber chair. When you flip over that footrest, you're not, you're not putting your foot on the edge of it that footrest is actually angled so that you can put your whole foot there. And that's the way a lot of these tops are. They're angled so you can put your whole foot there. And that's built into the platform top. Um, so we utilize an ultimate one stick with a UP angled top. There is a flat version. And it has a two, you can order a two or three step aider. You can order an ultimator. But I use, uh, use an aider that's a two step aider with about a 19 inch step difference uh, distance on it. So you walk up to the tree, literally this thing is either strapped to a tiny backpack, which uh, I utilize some, or sometimes I just carry it in if I'm being really minimalist. I'll have my bow in my left hand and my stick in my right hand, and that's it. I've got 40 foot of rappel rope in my pouch, in a dump pouch or an accessory pouch hanging on my left hip. Or if i am uh, got a tiny backpack, I'll have it in that. So I walk up to the base of the tree that I want to hunt. The great thing about one sticking is you are not limited to tree choice. You're not limited to limbs. You're not limited to anything. I can climb any tree, anywhere. If it limp, if it's got limbs all throughout it, if it leans, doesn't matter what the bark type is, it does not, not matter. I hunt the deer, not the tree. Once I find where I want to go in, I can climb trees as small as four inches around. It doesn't matter. So I'll walk up, take this take the, uh, the stick off my backpack, or if I'm carrying it, I'll just go ahead and just undo my rope that got a one sticking rope that you throw around the tree, bring it back in through typically what's a Harkin cam cleat. And the cleat is very important because um, I will affix it probably about head high. My webbing or nylon aider is hanging down that, that offers me the chance to step up to the stick. So I'll hang the stick up about head high. My angler is hanging down so close to where I can step up into my aider, dig my toe in, and walk up until I get to the stick. And then I, sometimes people will put a tether on before they climb. Sometimes people will put it at that point where they're only about six or seven foot off the ground. But that's in essence, that's what we one stickers call our first move. It's when we get up to the stand up on the top of the, the stick that we've fixed to the tree. At that point, we're probably standing about six foot off the ground. Well, yeah, I want to I, 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 I stop you right there because 
you know, I am comparing as you're talking. OK, so for those who are listening, right, you got people who who've never saddle hunted. But if you've used steps at all, even with a hang on, you understand. Right. I typically carry a set of uh, well, this past year I was using the, the double step. Uh, the double sticks from trophy line. So I have yep. a set of those. Uh, there's four sticks and yep. I carry those with me. And, you know, I don't always use all four. Uh, I mean, I killed a deer during rifle season. I two, Okay. Yep. But I, it took right. me two. it took me two sticks to get my feet, seven feet off the ground, say, okay. Right. Whereas right. you're basically saying you just put one stick on the tree and with your aider, now you're already seven feet off the ground in what you call one move. And for somebody like me, who typically I'm not obsessed most of the time with going real high, right. honestly, 12 to 15 feet is, is plenty most of the time. So I'm more, I mean, I know I'm, I'm jumping ahead in the story no, here, but but in two moves, you're going to be hunting. When so you're absolutely correct. In early season, before the, the foliage drops off of a tree, um, yes. When when the leaves are still on the tree, I only go up two moves. That's my typical hunting height. Uh, you said seven foot. I will be because there will be listeners that will try to p poke holes in this and poke holes in the theory, right? And typically, it's about six foot. So just being very honest for all the listeners that want to say, you're not getting seven foot, you're getting six foot. Okay, it's six foot. But but yeah, six foot up to the top of the my little stick that the where the platform is. And literally I'm just doing nothing more than what you would with trophy line mini doubles or long wolf six or whatever six you're using out there. I'm putting it on the tree, digging my toe into the aider and climbing up. It's no more work than using traditional hang on sticks. At, okay, at that point. I've done nothing extra. Talk to me about the aider for a second, because that's even for somebody like me. Now I've I'm I'm gonna just come clean, okay? I've yeah. not used I've not used an aider yet. And yeah. I mean I think about it and I'm like, oh, it's gonna be this floppy piece of nylon cord, or it's gonna be this floppy piece of am steel, and, and I'm gonna be like fumbling around and trying to get my foot to go in there and I can't see what I'm doing and it's going to be scary or I'm not going to feel safe. So talk to me about what kind of an aider you use. Uh, how long did it take you to feel comfortable with that? And, and how did you rig it up or customize it in a way that you felt like it really worked for you? Yeah, that's a great question because I had some of the very same, very same concerns you did. Uh, and early on, I, I would say the involvement of aiders in our industry has come so far because early on they were floppy and lightweight and they didn't have any rigid structure to them. And, and there, it was a it was a mess. Right. It, it was could wad up easy. They weren't supportive. As, I mean, not that they wouldn't hold your weight, but it was just it was more difficult to try to get your foot in them. Well, today's aiders have evolved so much. Uh, I actually use a, a nylon or a webbing aider. From a, from a company called Ultimator, developed uh, by a guy named John Richards. And what it is, is it, it's completely flexible and adjustable. You can start with the same aider. A lot of stone aiders, you know, you, you have to order in a 15-inch step or a 17-inch step or a 19-inch step. And as the weather gets colder and as we bulk up with our gear, your ability to lift your leg higher and stretch out on those steps is, is diminished somewhat. And John Richards with his ultimator, you can literally adjust the set distance with one aider as you go throughout the season. Uh, so it's really nice. But the main thing with the, with the aiders of today, whether it's a sewn or the ultimator that I use, is the, the actual rung of the step, even though it's webbing, they fill it with, you know, some of a harder substance. It's not like rock hard, but, you know, maybe more of a foam or a rubber piece inside, sewn inside the webbing that holds the, the ladder or the, the aider open for you. So literally all you've got to do with it is just stick your foot in and and dig your toe in and going up. It's almost, it, for someone who's done it as much as I have, but even when I started, it's almost as easy as climbing a solid aluminum step on like a trophy line mini double. It's, it's super easy. So, so in some ways, you know, just like for me, being skeptical of saddle hunting itself, when I first got into the saddle, the first time I ever got into a saddle was at the ATA show several years ago, just got in at the tethered booth, you know, right. and, and went up a little bit right there and, and realized like, 
man, it's way more comfortable than you think, right? It's Absolutely. way more uh, safe feeling than you think. It's not scary at all. Well, you're basically saying the same thing. Like you got all these ideas about, you know, what you might not like about an aider. But if you just get one of these quality aiders that are available on the market now and give it a try, you're going to realize that a lot of those concerns are not really founded and it's going to be very utilitarian for you. Totally agree. Totally agree. And and by and large, the mobile, wh whether you're one sticking or not, the mobile run and gun hunting community is already using aiders anyway, because the what people are doing is they're going down to an 18 to a 20 inch stick anyway, even if they're not run, even if they're not one sticking, they're using, they're pairing these 20 inch sticks with aiders because the 20 inch stick isn't going to get you to 20 foot, even if you have four of them, you're going to have to put some kind of aider, aider on them. So the, the hunting community is pretty well versed, I would say, at least this niche of it, with use, using aiders anyway. So at this point, if we go back to, to my you know explanation of how I want it, you really haven't done anything different than most of the community is doing. You're putting a stick on a tree, you're climbing up two rungs in a nylon aider to get to the little 12 inch or 15 inch one stick and climbing up on top of it. So you know people say, well, what's taking so hard? You haven't done anything different than normal. So at this point, we're, we're still on a level playing field. Other than the fact that I'm standing at six foot off the ground, whereas someone hanging a, a, one stick in a traditional scenario might be a couple foot off the ground. Does that make sure. sense? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so you've made your first move. You're six feet off the ground and your feet are on the top of your metal stick. Mm -hmm. What do you, now what do you do? You got to get that metal stick and get it up above you. Absolutely. And this is where a lot of people don't realize how safe this is and, and how little effort it is. And probably that's the, the part we'll focus on mostly, because what I do is I take my 40 foot rappel rope. Again, it's literally 40 foot of, of mountaineering rope that will, you know, the minimum breaking strength is something like five or 6,000 pounds. Some of these ropes are 6,500 pounds. They will literally hold a truck. And so uh, the mountaineering ropes today are just incredible. So I will literally throw it about head high and girth hitch it around with a quick link, a little a little silver uh, pencil quick link that's rated for mountaineering and climbing purposes as well. And literally I hook that into my saddle and slide it up as high as I can reach it. And then I literally lean down, grab the stick. And this is where the cam cleat that I mentioned to you earlier, I can just literally with one finger and thumb unclip the rope that's holding that one sticking rope on there because it's not some weird you know, configuration that, that where I had to attach the rope that it's literally a, a, cam, a mechanical cam, cam plate. If you think of Muddy made it kind of famous years ago with their Muddy sticks. They, they, they were the only stick that put this cam plate out there on it. I think they patented it. That's why you didn't see it on anybody else. So we're actually buying aftermarket cam plates and putting them on there. You can undo it with one hand, grab the stick, move it up above your head at this point. All you're doing is hanging by the rope. I'm exerting no energy. I'm not having to fight anything. I'm just, I'm hanging lifeless by my rope. So I reach down, grab the stick, put it above my head, throw the, throw the rope around the tree, run it back to the cam plate, pull down on the stick to set it hard and then climb back up again. And now when I get up to the stick again, I've made my second move. At that point, I'm 12 to 13 foot high off the ground with two moves and literally zero calories burned. It is so simple. People look oh, at it and go, well, you wouldn't do that in the summertime. You wouldn't do it in, in South Carolina in early season. Yeah, I would. It's just as easy. Well, I got to ask you a couple questions. So you're, you're there and you, you know, you put your climbing or your, your rappel rope around the tree and, and you're hooking that into your bridge, right? On your saddle? I, I hook it into my bridge via a device called a Mad Rock Safeguard. And so it is a technically in the mountaineering world, it's a belay device that people use to belay someone who's climbing up. We found out that in the community that it works exceptionally well as an ascender. So you can pull your rope tight and it keeps the rope tight as you pull it slack. It is also exceptional to descend or repel off of. So it's a two in one device, almost like a ropeman was when, uh, when people started using a ropeman early on with saddle hunting not technically intended to be used utilized in the saddle world but it's a, it's a great fit well the mad rock safeguard is the same way and there's other you don't have to use a mad rock safeguard let me 
clarify that early on because there's a lot of people who say, well, you don't need one to, to one stick. You're right, you don't. It's just a great device to use as an ascender and to repel with. You don't have to undo your rope and tie on a figure eight or some other device up there that's getting into a lot of other, you know, other details, but you don't have to undo your rope. You don't have to switch from a tether to a rappel rope or anything else. You can just go up with a Madrox safeguard and come down with a Madrox safeguard. It's super simple. But that's what the device is we're use, utilizing to clip into our bridge, as you said. And then, so once you're clipped in, you said, you know, you just hang in it. So are you literally at that point, you're, you know, you're, you're standing on your stick, you've put your rope around the tree, you've clipped into your bridge. At that point, are you basically just picking up your feet and letting your entire weight go go into the your saddle? And then that's when you're reaching down and grabbing your stick. 100% correct. I do. I literally take my feet and I, the way I do it and prefer the way it was shown to me that made a lot of sense to me. There are some people that will swing off to the side. To me, that's a lot harder. I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say, man, I, I used to swing my feet to the side. And then when I saw you do it the way you do it, it makes so much more sense. It was a lot more easy. It was a lot easier. Uh, I actually literally straddle the tree and put my left leg on the left side of the tree, my right leg on the right side of the tree, and just let, let my body weight swing in. I'm literally dead weight being held up by the, by the rope. And then at that point, I will reach down under the rope in my cam cleat, grab, the, grab it, and some people will complain about the noise of removing a rope from a cam plate. You can literally take your fingers and ease it out so it's whisper quiet. So in a hunting scenario, I've, I've been really, I hunt a lot of buck beds and I hunt close to deer sometimes when I'm trying to move in, move in tight. I can make that move without making a sound. And then I just literally grab the stick and put it up there. And I let the rope hold the stick while I've got my hands free. I literally put, I will lean out to give the rope some, some room from the tree, put my stick up as high as I can, and then lean back in and let the rope hold my stick in place and I'm hands free. And then I'll, I can throw the rope around the tree, put it in the cam cleat, again, pull the rope, set it, climb right up. Well, I had one more thing about coming off the stick after the first move is you want to be careful, right? You adjust the length of, you don't want to have a lot of slack so that when you take your feet off and straddle the tree, you don't want to drop. You, 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 you want to lengthen that right. Yeah, yeah, and and you pretty much will, once you move the rope up overhead, you should be pretty well, you know, devoid of tether slack. But you're right, you'll you'll get a feel really quickly to how much slack or how much length you need to be able to reach down and grab your stick. I mean, within two or three times of doing this, you'll have developed a feel for okay, I need about this much slack to be able to hang and reach down and grab my stick. Well, and the nice thing is, if you want to go out and start practicing this. You're you're not all that high off the ground when yeah. you're making your 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 second move. You know what I mean. So you can you can mess around with this in the backyard, and that's why I actually think you know here we are in February. You know you think well deer season's pretty much just ended, but you know springtime's just around the corner, and most people if you're serious about wanting to do this this year, you know you're coming into the best time of year to start to get comfortable with this stuff, and you can really. You can do some practicing shooting, you know, practicing your setups, getting up and down and, and all that stuff. And by the time the season comes, you're going to be ready to go. But um, OK, so to bring me back, my next question, you actually started to answer because I'm like, all right, now you've got, uh, you know, you're hanging all your weight in the saddle. You've taken your stick off the tree. Now you've got that in your hand. The aider right. is ha hanging off the bottom of it. And, yep. and you've got to get get that up there. But you've got your your repelling rope is going to be in the way. So you kind of answered that because you said you kind of lean lean out and get that underneath and, and come in and it actually holds it for you. Do you take both your hands off of that thing? And I mean, I aren't you aren't you nervous about that? You're going to it's going to fall down and then you're going to be hanging there in the tree looking down at the ground and there's your stick. I, I'm actually not. Uh, yeah. I, so so if both my thighs are on opposite sides of the tree. At that point, when I grab the stick, I, I literally will sometimes just take, I'll, I'm holding the stick in my right hand. I'll take my left hand and gently push off until I can get my knees in front of the tree. And then I, I've got enough space in my rappel rope that's tethered, that's girth hitched above me. That gives me enough space to, to reach up and wedge the, uh, the one stick up above me. Sometimes I'll even get my feet out on the tree so I can come way out. And that allows me to move my stick up even higher. Uh, but when I come back down at that point and, and again, just allow the rope to hold me and hang, that stick isn't going anywhere. I've got, you know, I'm 180 pounds 
without clothes on by the time I put my boots and gear and everything else, I'm probably pushing 200 by the time I put, you know, belts and gear and jackets and whatever on. Um, yeah, my 200 pounds holding that stick, it's not going anywhere. So, um, yeah, at that point, it's it's stuck to the tree. All I got to do is throw the rope around, grab it with my left hand, and pull it back through the cam cleat as tight as I can. I try to make sure that it's, you know, it's a really straight perpendicular throw around the tree. And then I'll lean out, set the stick really hard. That's important. If you've ever heard or if anybody out there listening has ever uh, seen someone, you know, complain about a kick out, it's because they didn't set their stick. It rarely happens in the one sticking world. You'll see it more when people are using four sticks. They complain about a kick out. But setting a stick in the one sticking world is just as important as setting a stick when you're using four traditional sticks as well. So I'll set it before I climb up onto it with my aider again. So at this point now, you know, you're pretty much just doing the same thing all over again. Now you're going to climb, climb up your aider. You're going to get onto your stick. You're going to be at the, the top of the stick again. And, you know, this is just wash, rinse, rinse, repeat. You could do this as many times as you want to. And like we already discussed, your platform is basically is the top rung of this stick. So yep. whenever, whenever you get to the point where that's as high as you want to go, it's, you're just hunting. And so now that that brings us to the to the other side of this, which to me is like the most curious part and, and maybe like the most part that I'd be the most apprehensive about. So now Greg's up there. Let's say it was later in the season. There wasn't any cover and you are, um, you know, you had to go up 25 feet, 30 feet. Let's just say you're 30 feet in the air now you're going to rappel down this tree what in the world how do you do this so i'll so i'll start off by saying this and I, i've said this on a, a lot of forums and a lot of groups rappelling down is the safest way out of a tree irrespective of your climbing method so if you go up with fours i know some guys that they go up with four six just like we've always done for 20 years or so and they still rappel down once they discover rappelling rappelling is so safe it's so easy you're always attached to the tree if you fall you swing a couple foot into the tree. You don't, you know, go down and, and have a lineman belt holding you and go down 15 foot or whatever. Uh, Repelling is so safe. It's so nice if you're at the end of a cold hunt, your fingers are frozen and numb. You don't have to worry about falling ever. No matter if you were 35 foot up hunting, you don't have to worry about falling when you're repelling down. It's so nice. So my my tether is still up there around four head height, right, when I'm when I'm hunting. So the great thing about hunting off that Mad Rock safeguard is I'm already set up to repel. I hunt that way. The only thing I do when I get ready to repel down is I literally lean back. There's a handle on the Mad Rock safeguard. I slowly engage or pull that, hand, that handle. That allows the device to turn a little bit and feed the repel rope through the device. And I can do it in a very, I can ease back a sixteenth of an inch at a time. It literally gives you that much control. So I ease back and drop myself down just enough so that I'm low enough with my one sticking stick that I've been standing on and hunting on, that I remove that from the tree. Well, first of all, let me back up. The first thing I do is I take Dynaglide. I have Dynaglide, which is a throw rope or a pull-down rope, and I attach that to my my rappel rope because that's what I'm going to use to get to retrieve my rope when I, once I'm staying on the ground. And I've got videos about this on my channel as well because people go, well, how do you get your rope down from the tree? That was one of my first questions when I started this whole process. It's very simple. You attach your, your pull-down rope to the rope that's girth hitched around the tree that you've been hunting off of. It's been your rappel rope or your tether. You attach that first and throw the, the diaglide to the ground. Just let it go. And then I ease myself down, grab my stick, roll it up, fold it up. And I actually have a little bitty uh, clip that's on the side of my saddle. And the stick has a, has a corresponding clip. It's a male and a female a little clip I clip it on it literally hangs off the side of my hip so my hands are still free and then I grab grab my rappel rope I put my brake hand just as we were taught when we were rappelling in the army I put it back off to the side and I start grabbing that handle and just walking myself the best thing to do is it's scary at first most people aren't willing to do this at first some people want to walk themselves down the tree still standing straight up and down like we stand on the ground the best thing to do is plant your feet in the tree and allow yourself to come out at about a 40 degree angle so that you're leaning where your back is literally against the ground. Now you can walk yourself down as slow or sometimes, if I depends on what mood I'm in, sometimes I'll hop down like Batman 
like you see an aerosol team or something like that, fast rope down a seal team. If I'm in a mood, I'll just have fun and do it. Other times I'm, you know, if it's cold and wet, and it's been icy and sleeting, I'll be more careful and I'll walk myself down. But the great thing is you are in complete control of your descent. You can walk yourself down as slow as you want. And if you slip, you're not going anywhere. You're literally tethered in right there. There is no way to fall that way. It is so awesome and safe. So talk to me about how you control the feed of the the rope. Obviously, as you're going down, the rope's got to be moving through or else you're not going anywhere. But like you said, you don't want to lose control and just go. Vroom. So right. talk to me about what you're doing with the front hand, the back hand, that little mad rock or whatever you're talking about. Yeah. T- tell me, explain to me how it all works together. So it's basically, there, there's a two or three different ways. Some people will repel with a Mad Rock Safeguard or, or even a Grigri Plus, and some people will tie a Muncher Hitch around a carabiner, which is the cheapest option. Uh, it's just a, a, a series of loops around a carabiner. Some people will use a figure eight. In all scenarios, it's the amount of friction that's going through that device, and, and that's what controls your descent rate. In my case, using a Mad Rock Safeguard, when I, the harder I pull on that lever, the more it turns the device and allows the rope to flow more freely through it. If I barely pull on the device, it keeps the device cocked somewhat and there's more friction on it. When I pull that handle harder and harder and harder, it opens up or turns is more appropriate. It turns the device and lets the rope flow freely. So if I barely want to come down, I barely pull on the handle. And of course, you're always wanting to kind of keep a good handle on your tag end of your rappel rope with your brake hand. That's a great backup. You don't, you never just want to repel free free handed without holding onto the tag end using a brake hand. But so in combination of two of ho- holding onto the rope with my brake hand and barely pulling the handle, I can literally let a sixteenth of an inch go through at a time. Or the harder I pull, the more rope comes through and the faster the descent rate is. So it's now all is, controlled by how you you control it. Now is that handle that you're talking about? Is that spring loaded so that if you would like lose control or your hand just comes off it, it's going to close and you're going to stop? It is. So, so with a Mad Rock Safeguard, which is my preferred device, it is spring loaded and you have to let go or push it up. Letting go would instantly do it. So, so if you get scared or you're in a situation where you're falling too fast, let go of the handle. It's instantly going to stop you. I just did a review on my channel uh, last week, actually comparing a Grigri Plus, which is made by Petzl, not Mad Rock, and it has an anti-panic feature in the handle. So if you pull too hard, it instantly stops and locks you up. Now, you do have to be at a certain weight. We discovered that with my son, Gabe. He was actually too too light to engage that feature, that anti-panic feature. So you do need to have a little bit of bulk to you for that feature to work. But there are those are the differences in it. With a Mad Rock safe car, you let go, it stops. With a pencil Grigory Plus, if you have enough oomph in your butt, when you pull over too hard, it will stop too. Well, thankfully, you and I don't have to worry about being heavy it enough does. to oh. activate the safety feature. Now, how does the rope orient to your body? Obviously, it's coming off the tree and it's going through that device, you know, which is attached to your um is it still attached to your bridge or do you change anything? Okay, so it's still on your bridge. And what about the tag end of the rope? Is it wrapped around your body, through your legs, or you just literally, it's just coming down right here in front of you and you're you're holding it behind your back with your other hand? I, I'm not a repelling yeah. expert, so I got to ask yeah, all no, the stupid questions. No, that's a great question for, for those people who are looking at this for the first time. It's a great question. No, I literally... Uh, you know, when, when we were taught to repel in, in the Army and things like that, you literally put, put your brake hand behind the small of your back, right? And that, that friction going around your, your, your side helps. You, you don't really necessarily – I just hold it off to the side. You know, I, I, the tag end goes to my strong hand. Luckily, I'm right-handed, and the Madrox safeguard is made so that you pull the lever out to the left with your weaker hand. So my left hand is up here pulling the handle. My tag – my brake hand is my strong hand, my right hand. And so I'm just literally holding it kind of off to the side, maybe at a 30 degree angle, just letting it kind of slip, slip through and freely. And it's just kind of off to the side. And then the rest of it just dangles down to the, to the ground. Now, the other question that I have about this whole thing is, because I'm thinking about you going down 
maybe not so much one of your slow days, but one of your Batman days, Tarzan yeah. days, and you're you're moving. You know, you might be down there in about three seconds, maybe two yeah. seconds. You're on the ground. Do you wear gloves for this purpose? Do you, you know? No. The, I'm, I'm thinking about rope burn on your hands. Yeah, on those days, I'm letting the man rock absorb more of the more of the friction, and it's so. And I'll just still lightly let it go through my hand. Uh, it I don't get any rope band, and there's probably times that I've come down from 25 foot in a second and a half, two seconds tops. I mean, I, there's times that two hops I'm down pretty much. I don't do that very often, but but I've done it. Uh, and in those times, you can when you do hit the ground, and, and I'll feather myself down, or at the last second, I'll start feathering myself down so I touch. And there's plenty of videos on my channel of me showing me just feathering myself down and literally barely coming down, even when I was coming down fast. Um, but then when you reach up and touch that mad rock, it's warm. <laughs> so uh, so it absorbed most of the friction. And, uh, you know, you probably don't want to do that a ton. Uh, you know, I don't know what detrimental effect it would have on your repelling rope. But, uh, you know, I don't do it very often, but, but occasionally. So, you know, I really wanted to spend most of the time on this with the technique, you know, the actual mechanics of the one sticking, but no good saddle hunting conversation would be complete without talking about how much weight we're shaving here. So, you know, geek out for eh, a little bit for me, you know, like I'm sure you've weighed it out and you've compared it. So what is, you know, the total weight of your one sticking saddle setup versus, you know, a traditional set of, you know, four sticks? Yeah, I, we actually just posted a video about three weeks ago now, I believe, and the title of it is, Can You Really Hit Sub-10 Pounds as a Saddle Hunter? Because a lot of people, you know, they look at saddle hunting, and they're like, well, it's supposed to save all this weight, but I see these guys walking in with 30 pounds and 25 pounds. So are you really saving any weight? Well, a lot of guys don't save a lot of weight. They're saving bulk. They're saving a lot of other things, but a lot of guys don't save weight. I wanted to post that video and show you can save weight if you want to. So I did that. I geeked out in that video. Uh, you know, I weighed every single thing that it was required to hunt and put in a good hunt that I typically would do. And I walk in a lot, a lot of times like this. You know, you got a, a 40 foot rope is 1.3 pounds. Uh, my one sticking stick is 2.7. By the time I added everything up, I was at 8.9 pounds. And that's with everything. That's a range finder. That's a that's everything that I need to walk into the woods. A bow hanger. Everything. Uh, that was everything minus my bow. It it, it was my, uh, like I said, it, it was a grunt tube. It was a range finder. It was a bow holder. It was my rappel rope. It was my my platform. Everything came to 8.9 pounds that you can walk into the woods with. Do you typically carry a pack of any kind when you go in? So early season last year, I did not. I carried, I walk in with my stick in one hand, my bow in the other. I got to, by the time I needed to, um, needed to start wearing a light jacket. I wanted to go to a pack so I didn't have to hold it or figure out how to tie it around my waist or anything. I went to a tiny backpack, started scrapping my one stick to it, being able to put my backpack in it and it freed up my hands. And and why that becomes such a big necessity is a lot of times I'm going to these places blind. You know, we talked about this patchwork of public land I'm going into. Uh, literally I'll pull into a parking lot or off this pull off to the shoulder of the road and I have no idea where I'm going when I get out of my vehicle. None. I'm walking in the hunting hot side, looking for transition areas, edges that I talk about a lot. I have no idea where I'm going. Consequently, when I come out of the woods, I'm coming out blind. So it was important for me to have one of my hands free, have a bow in one hand, and then to be able to hold my my phone after dark so I can look at on X and figure out how to navigate myself back to the vehicle. That's where that tiny backpack really came in handy as well. So I have started using one of those a lot, especially well, later seasons. The other thing I was wondering is if you don't take a pack, do you have everything that you need in the event that you would actually kill a deer, you know, to take care of the deer, get the deer back to your vehicle? Or would you typically be making, you know, say, OK, I'm going to go in real minimal. If I happen to be successful, I'm just going to have to make an extra walk back to the vehicle to get some other supplies that I might need. So, so you nailed it. Uh, I, you know, it's well known. I, I've, I've mentioned it several times. I put in over 100 sits a year. Now, that's not 100 days. That's 100 sits. So, you know, morning sit and afternoon sit, those are typically two different trees, two different sits. I'll count that as two sits. But every season, I put in over 100 sits I have for 20 plus years. I kill an average of five deer a year, six deer, deer a year, something like that. That's 95 sits that 
it's not worth it for me. I, it comes out, I come out money ahead if I don't carry in a kill kit and a frame pack and all this stuff like that. I'll leave that back at the car. Typically, my preferred way of getting a deer out in ag country in the Midwest is with a cart, with a, with a big aluminum cart. It, in the car, in the trunk, I've got fold down seats. It's stationed back there. I'll go, I'm going back to get the carts anyway, unless I'm hunting in deep in the national forest with huge ridges that I've got, a, I'll take a pack frame with me. But either way, I'm going back for some method or mode of transporting that deer out. At that point is when I get my kill kit, my, you know, my gloves or my knife and baby wipes and all this stuff like that. I'll get that and go back in after the deer. I'm money ahead 95 times out of the year that I don't kill a deer. Well, and the advantage of that too, I mean, obviously it adds an extra um, hike, but you can leave some of the stuff that you have with you too. You know, you don't need your bow. Uh, you can leave yep. your bow and, and some other things. And, and so um, there's, there's pros and cons to it either way, but I was just curious as to how you do that. And the other thing that I forgot, I, I kind of jumped ahead to some of this other stuff. Once you got to the ground, I kind of felt a sigh of relief because I'm like, whoo, we made it. We're back down on the ground, safe and sound. We didn't die. Um, but you talked about how you put that, I forget what you called it, that other kind Dynaglide, of rope. Simply. Yeah, Dynaglide. So once you're back down, how do you get your rope out of the tree? And, you know, how, how easy is that to do? And have you ever had a situation where, you know, your rope got stuck out there? I think a lot of trees that I've hunted uh, and do hunt, you know, locally, sometimes the trunks will split or, mm -hmm. or there'll be some rim, limbs and there's some like tight v type notches and stuff and it would be easy for like a knot on a rope or anything like that to get caught and you'd be down there you know flipping this thing up and down trying to get it to come out of the tree yeah it's amazing how easy a, a rope actually retrieves and pulls out of a tree and i've got a video on that called three ways to retrieve your three tips to retrieve your repel rope but typically we attach our our pull down rope right behind the knot that attaches to that quick link that we use to girth hitch around and so as soon as you start pulling the rope down from the bottom of the tree with that pull down rope, it immediately pulls that, that the only knot that's in your rope, it immediately removes that from the surface or contact area of the tree. So now that's off the tree, everything else is smooth. So at that point, you can pull it through limbs, through, through forks, through anything. It's super easy. One of the key areas, and again, I, I would suggest if people are struggling or, or they want to know how to pull a rope down is watch that video on my channel, three tips to, to pulling down a repel, or a repel rope. But the biggest key is just walk out at an angle, pull from about a 30 to 40 degree angle, and the thing just comes out like butter almost every time. It does. I've climbed trees with 20, 25 limbs, and it just comes right out. Well, I got to say, Greg, you know, like, I, and I suppose this is the path that we all take because I always laughed, you know, at saddle hunting until I became a saddle hunter. And, you know, I always uh, kind of scoff at the idea of one sticking. And I guess that's what we all did until we became one stickers. So now I'm kind of feeling like, you know, and again, I like to say this not because I want to brag, but because I want other people who, again, you know, look at me, look at you and yeah. say, hey, they're just a couple of pretty normal, average looking bow hunters. If they can do this stuff, we can do this stuff. So I say, you know, hey, I've been using a saddle for two seasons. I don't do all my hunting out of a saddle. I don't kill all my deer out of a saddle, but I've killed three deer out of a saddle in two seasons, you know, uh, two bucks and a doe, two with the bow, one with the rifle. It's a great tool. It's not something that, you you know, you have to say, hey, if I'm going to become a saddle hunter, that's it. You know, I'm all saddle all the time. No, you can you can do it all. But it's a tool just like any other tool, you know, just like a laser range finder or a good pair of binoculars or some quiet clothing or an Ozonics unit. You know, the right equipment will not in guarantee you success but it will make it easier for you to achieve success if you have the requisite skills you know to, to be a, a good hunter and so i kind of feel like man i got to do the same thing with one sticking like i need to at least give it a try and say you know what i'm gonna give it a, a fair chance i'm gonna go set up a couple times and try to do this and by golly maybe i'll just be able to kill a deer and say hey i took the one sticking challenge you know yeah you know the, the 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 one thing i would add to that is don't make a decision based on one time i i fell in love with it after one time 
I, I'm probably an anomaly. I would give it four or five chances to give it a fair shake. Because after the first time or two, might be a little awkward. And then by climb three or four, it's probably starting to kick in at that point. So I would give it four or five chances to, to give it a fair shake. And then you'll see that you can literally walk in. It's not only sub 10 pounds, sub nine if you choose to. Well, that's awesome, man. I, I tell you what, I, 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 you know, you've got me intrigued. This is a conversation I've wanted to have with you for a long time. I hope that people who are watching, listening, that you've gotten intrigued too. If you're a serious, you know, mobile hunter. And again, I love that. It's a great term, but, but sometimes I think it's misunderstood because we think of mobile hunting as guys like Greg who specialize in public land or some of these Western guys that are always going a far distance from the vehicle. But mobile hunting is just as much for people like me who typically might only be a few hundred yards from the vehicle as it is for, for anybody because it's that mobility. 50 yards can be big mobility when it comes to fooling you know, a mature buck or a nanny doe, you know, that has no, she, you know, there are some does, you know it too, you know, they know where every fixed position stand in their home range is, you know what I mean? And they're not going to walk through there until they see if anybody's in the tree. Yeah, the, the story that I told about the, the gentleman who brought his big, you know, almost 300 inch deer to Iowa is so relevant, you know, is, is deer pattern us quicker than we pattern them. And so if, if you own private ground, if you own a lease, mobility to your point, is still extremely important, extremely. Well, listen, man, I, I really appreciated your time. You know, I always say it pretty much every episode. The time goes by really quick. I think we're coming up on about an hour, and I think we did about as good of a job as we can without the aid of, you know, actual yeah. video. And, and thankfully, Greg, you've got all that. So if yeah. we have whet your appetite for one sticking or any kind of saddle hunting information today you've got a lot of content that you know people can tune into they're on your youtube channel and the other nice thing about that is i know that you're a man of the people you know a true public servant and if people put comments on your videos or if they reach out to you on social media yeah. you're always happy to try and help people out and figure things so that they can be more successful out there in the field Absolutely. There's there's no question about it. I probably answer 20 to 30 messages a week on, on one sticking alone. So uh, feel free. If, if you've got questions, if you're interested, hit me up and uh, we'll try to help you out as much as, as we can. Well, folks, there you have it. Mr. Greg Staggs from Staggs in the Wild in the great state of Missouri. Um, that's the show me state and Greg has been showing people the way on how to one stick and, and, and just enjoy uh, bow hunting. And I appreciate it, man. Uh, it's always good to catch up with you. Please give my best to your boys, to your wife. And, um, you know, hopefully you guys will have a, I know you guys always do a big turkey tour usually. And I think I saw a, a post the other day where you were trying to plan the route for this year's turkey tour. So, hey, good luck on those birds. Yep. That's, that's the schedule right there. Thank you, Christian. How many states you hitting this year? Five. We're hitting five, five? five states. Five states in what, two weeks? Uh, probably about three to four. I'm hoping that we can schedule out. Three, five and two is going to be hard, but I, I think about about four if I can get it out that way. Yeah, Man, it'll, that, it'll, be that is... it'll be a busy month. Wow, it sure will, but I know you wouldn't have it any other way. Hey, thanks again so much. Really appreciate it, and I'm going to look for those gobbler photos on your social feeds in the near future. Sounds good. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand, or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com.